Welcome, everyone. I'm Susan Kish. I'm part of the Programming Committee for Data for Good, and I'm happy to be the host for this next session. We have four really interesting, one, two, three, four, five really interesting papers around vulnerable, meaning the protection of youth. Our first speaker is Shirag Nakpal. He's a graduate student in machine learning at Carnegie Mellon and is going to talk about human trafficking online. Shirag. Um, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody at the back hear me? Thanks, Susan, uh, for introducing me. I'm Chirag. I'm from Carnegie Mellon. This is joint work with Kyle, Ben, and my advisor, Professor Arta Dubrowski from the Auton Lab. I'll be talking about entity resolution for isolating instances of human trafficking from online publicly available web data. Um, so before I begin, I'd like to motivate the problem by uh, elucidating the challenges that we have in this particular setting. Uh, so most of this activity manifests itself on forums online. So you have uh, these uh, advertisement aggregating websites that advertise escorts who might actually be victims of trafficking. Uh, escorts, as uh, most of us are aware, is a euphemism for the flesh trade. A um, lot of the victims who are being advertised are actually underage, uh, which aggravates the problem. Um, so our, uh, our approach here is to leverage machine learning approaches in order to make sense out of this data, uh, which is noisy and structured. Uh, and I'll be talking about some of these approaches uh, during this presentation. Um, so uh, before I begin, I'd first like to uh, show how the data actually looks like. So this is an example of um, one of the aggregating websites. On the left, you have search results on, uh, on, on one of these forums. And on the right, you have a particular advertisement advertising an escort. Uh, now, as you can appreciate, uh, the, these advertisements are inundated with uh, emojis, special characters. And all these things mean something or the other. Uh, it's, uh, they, use these, uh, they use these to obfuscate uh, the nefarious activity that's taking place. Um, but they all have, uh, they're all markers that can be informative for a machine learning approach, uh, for a machine learning pipeline. So the first challenge is actually, how do you take this unstructured data and put it in a fixed schema uh, from where you can actually start building models? Um, so we do that using simple regular expressions. Uh, so we create these handcrafted regular expressions um, that reflect the nature of this domain. So you, if you go and look at these advertisements, you'll find so, uh, certain features about the individuals being advertised, like hair color, eye color, ethnic background of the individual, and also some more interesting and more informative uh, features like restrictions. So at, at times, certain, certain entities that are being advertised have restrictions when it comes to uh, customers, uh, they don't prefer customers from a particular ethnic background or a particular age. Uh, and so we try to map all these into our fixed schema uh, by using these handcrafted regular expressions. We've released this as an open source tool. Um, the link is there. Um, so now that we actually have models that can, uh, uh, that can take this unstructured noisy data and convert them into a fixed representation, we can actually start building models. Uh, and for doing that, um, our first approach is entity resolution. Um, now, when, when we have the structured data, we need certain features based on which we can actually perform entity resolution. So the, the whole idea behind entity resolution is, given these set of advertisements, can you identify the sources from which these advertisements are coming from? Uh, so out of these features, we have certain strong features like phone numbers, which are highly informative. Um, and, and we can use those phone numbers to cluster these advertisements together based on, uh, based on the source. However, there's challenges associated with that. Um, the the uh, sources of these advertisements keep changing the phone numbers often, and so it's hard to have a very robust model to perform this clustering on the data itself. So uh, this is where we introduce machine learning. Uh, we use phone number information to create proxy ground truth. Um, and we randomly sample pairs of advertisements that share the same phone number. We featureize these pairs using the structured schema that we have. And then we can train a classifier in a supervised fashion that can leverage the extra information that we have in our feature set apart from the phone numbers to predict if the advertisements are indeed from the same source or not. So now we don't really need to rely on the phone numbers, but we can rely on the other features in the advertisement to find out if two advertisements are related to each other or not. 
Um, we tried uh, simple classification models and also ensembling techniques and obviously ensemble models like random forests and gradient boosted trees outperformed simpler linear classifiers. Um, we also experimented with uh, what are the features that um, help improve the classification uh, problem that we have here. And um, basically, as you keep adding more and more features, the performance keeps going up. Um, uh, in order to um, use this classifier in the op operational setting, we tune it heuristically for a fixed uh, false positive rate. Uh, so when we actually perform the entity resolution, we have to be very careful not to introduce too many false positives because then everything starts getting matched to everything else and the data stops making sense. If we, on the other hand, use it at a very high false, uh, low false positive rate, uh, rate, the clusters are very granular and you don't really gain from the entity resolution process in the first place. So that's something that we need to tune heuristically. So this is one of how an entity looks like after the process of entity resolution. The nodes here represent individual advertisements, and the edges represent uh, the, uh, the fact that our classifier found them to be related to each other. As you can appreciate, this particular entity um, uh, operated in multiple uh, city, uh, cities as well as states in the United States. Um, they, uh, so most of these entities have a complex distribution, both temporally as well as spatially. Some of the features that we uh, found, uh, that our classifiers in fact found, were uh, informative to perform this entity resolution was the location from where the advertisement is being posted, number of special characters, also temporal information like the time difference between advertisements. So at times you'll find that on one of these forums, uh, the person's advertising would inundate the same entity uh, multiple times. So that kind of trend is something that our classifier was able to pick up. Uh, again, uh, features like particular presence of particular ethnic information, um, restrictions, like I mentioned, was also found to be informative. Um, so this is another example of an entity that we found out. There were 26 ads, all used the, generally the same description, the same name, uh, but and operated in different locations uh, using different phone numbers. But our ent entity resolution uh, approach was able to identify the fact that all these advertisements were indeed um, advertising the same individual. So now that we have these entities, uh, we can go about uh, building classification models on top of entities themselves. So in, initially, I mentioned that the advertisements themselves are extremely sparse. Uh, there's also the challenge of lack of ground truth. So um, the ground truth that we aggregate is from law enforcement agents or, uh, and tends to be highly skewed and um, less informative. But now that we have these entities, uh, we, we, we alleviate those problems associated with the data itself and also with the lack of ground truth. And we can perform classification at the, uh, at the entity level itself. Um, again, we um, experimented with the ensemble techniques um, like random forest, gradient booster trees. Um, and we found that our models ended up performing better than the random, uh, random baselines. Uh, however, a challenge with that was to I actually um, make it operationally useful for the end user, the law enforcement agents in this setting. And so we also, inter uh, we also experimented with more interpretable, simple rule learning approaches uh, and found that even simple rule learning models were able to isolate positives versus negatives, although they were not as good as the ensemble methods that we trained earlier. Um, uh, so uh, some of the friends, uh, some of our friends from our lab ha under, um, uh, have been trying to make this uh, uh, commercially available. Um, Marinus Analytics uh, is uh, one of our partners that has been using our technology and, um, and putting it in the commercial domain um, uh, for helping law enforcement agencies across the United States and Canada. Um, Currently, we have uh, more than 500 users, and over the last three years, uh, over 300 victims of trafficking have been found. Um, so that's all. I think we have around a minute, so I can take questions. Uh, once you had the entities, uh, what was the response variable that you were classifying on? Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. So the ground truth that we have is actually phone numbers themselves. Um, so we have a list of phone numbers that we know have prior evidence of trafficking. And then we can, um, if the presence of a phone number in one of those entities, can the entire entity be labeled as a positive entity? And entities which do not contain any of those phone numbers are labeled as negative, and then we can 
train a binary classifier over that. Does that answer your question? Just a really quick question. You were showing the um, the example where the the subject was moving around. Have you been able to identify the you know anything from your data to identify the origin of those particular people? Um, so, um, so what we have observed in other research that we've done is that some of this temporal movement ends up being correlated with other public events like Super Bowl. That was one of the papers that uh, our lab uh, that our lab actually uh, tried to tackle and see if. Indeed, such activity is correlated with these public events or not. Uh, but it's, it's really hard to, so when you say the source, you mean like the geographical source? Or so it's, it's really hard to say because they tend to keep moving around. But uh, for us, the source is actually the phone numbers. So uh, as long as we can find the phone numbers, uh, we are good. That's how we identify sources. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. I'd like to ask Johnson Chie and Angie Wang to come up. They're both with uh, DSP, and we'll talk about domestic violence prediction. OK. OK. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. I'm Johnson. I'm coming from DSP. And uh, the default is to data for so, so good interactive, initiative uh, organizer. Uh, what is default is default is help a uh, public survey organization use uh, data analysis to help uh, organization improve their uh, operational efficiency and uh, uh, make some policy uh, recommendation. So, since uh, 2016, we have lead nearly 19 volunteer data scientists to complete uh, 16, uh, 16 uh, projects, including uh, farmland farm pollution, uh, fire risk prediction, and uh, emerging health care and uh, worker schedule. Today we are happy to uh, discuss a case about uh, domestic violent risk management. And we well, are welcome to Andrew. Uh, I'm Angie, and I'm going to talk more about the project. So in this project, we work with Taipei City Government City uh, Center for Prevention of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. We used uh, their 2015 database. And through consulting with the Prevention Center, we found out actually the most important problem they are facing right now is that the supply of social workers fail to meet the demand of increase of uh, cases. So as you can see from 2009 to 2015, there is more than 20% of increase of cases. And just in 2015, one social worker is assigned 116 cases to deal with. Among these cases, more than half of them are intimate partner violence cases and more than, more than one third of them are repeat victimization. And this means that it, there will, uh, if we could identify the red flag of uh, a potential repeat victimization cases in its initial sub, uh, report, we can avoid about 2,000 cases in the future. So um, after discussion, we decided it's most effective to approach this issue in two strategies. So one is the community level, which is the macro level, and the other is the individual level, which is the micro level. And for the community level, we built a uh, domestic violence interactive dashboard to visualize how domestic violence cases are distributed in a city. And this is actually important because mostly uh, for traditional approaches to domestic violence, they use like qualitative interviews or uh, focus group. But visualizing DV case distribution give them a more micro, uh, macro understanding of how this, how to approach this issue. And for the individual level, we built a, we used random forest method to build a risk prediction model. Uh, this model enables social workers to identify the risk level of future violence when of cases coming in for the first time. And it also helps domestic violence victims to understand their situation better and become more aware of their future risk level. So for the community level, we build a, a risk dashboard. So first of all, we collected the, we collected the cases and uh, categorized them into four types. Uh, intimate partner violence, uh, the adolescent and young uh, population, elderly protection, and inter-siblings and others. Then we use Google Map, uh, Google Map API to 
to convert their location. Then lastly, we just visualize their demographic features in terms of like gender, age, income, and disability levels. And on the individual level, we need to first identify which risk factors we need, to, which risk factors we want to include in our model. So first of all, we do an extensive uh, literature review and to see what are the important factors that usually included by the researchers. So we categorize them into three groups, the individual group and the community group and relationship group, which is marked in the circle. Then we check with our database to see what proxies and variables are able to use that is corresponding to the research papers. So those are listed as items outside the circles. And after analysis, we included the most important variables in our models, which are marked in yellow. And those could be seen as uh, such as attachment, end of relationship and threat variables in the relationship category, and the demographic cognition and psychological behavioral variables in the individual uh, category. So uh, going back to the modeling process, we use our training set to categorize the cases into three levels, the low risk level, medium risk level, and high risk level. And we use another untrained data set to do our model validation. And at first, um, so for in general, if you look at the cases, the report times will range between one and seven. But actually, only 4% of the cases are marked with uh, more than three times of reports. So we have uh, this imbalanced category, imbalanced categories of uh, problems that we need to solve. So we propose an adjusted framework to build a more robust model. And our results show that this model has an average accuracy of 96.3% and a recall rate of 88.9%. And here, uh, because for social work discipline, they, they tend to take on a more conservative approach in handling cases. So it's more appropriate to predict a non-high non risk level cases into a high risk level instead of the other way around. So this is why recall, a high recall rate is important in this model. And so our final result, uh, if we if a uh, social worker input a new case into our model, it will immediately give an output of uh, the high, medium, or low risk level, and according to the score it gets. And uh, this is a three months project. So as far as we know, this is the first project that we that use machine learning on domestic violence protection. Uh, protection. So um, we identify some important impacts of this project. So first of all, this project, through, through discussing with social workers, we helped them increase their data literacy. So they were, um, uh, they were able to grab some very basic and like some more advanced ideas about like random forest model. So this top left picture showed our director of the prevention center help other governmental officials in understanding how to use data science in approaching other social problems they face in their governmental sectors. And the second one is, uh, this visualization of the dashboard helped them help social workers in identifying which community needs immediate actions. And they were able to talk to the community leaders and uh, give, offering them training workshop and helping them identify which are the important areas in their community and who are, which are the cases that they need to deal with immediately. And also, um, our project was recognized by other government centers, such as uh, the Department of Wel Social Welfare and the Department of, uh, and the Center for Prevention. So they agreed for us to upgrade from the proof of concept to pilot run, and hopefully we will be able to move our pilot run to real production. And also, um, because our project is gaining recognition in Taiwan, we were able to work with more governmental sectors and other non-for-profit non organizations in implementing more domestic violence projects. And so we were originally working with Taipei CD, and now we expand our skills into new Taipei CD and also down south to Taiwan. And we are currently looking for more uh, working opportunities. So if you have your, if you're interested in our project details, please go to our official website at d4sg.org. Or if you have any questions, feel free to email us. And also, like if you are interested in working uh, with us, please feel free to talk to us in the conference later. Thank you so much. So. 
These guys are finishing ahead of time. We have time for one question from the floor. Uh, hi. Um, your accuracy for detection was very high. And I'm wondering, um, is this the end of your project or if you are going to take further steps uh, and you know, look at other issues that are related? Um, so our project is the first, the first stage of project. We have other, uh, we have another two extended projects, and the other project is working on the validation and optimi optimization of our model. Johnson, would you like to talk about the result? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, this project is my with our first first test, and uh, we, uh, we are use um, uh, 2000, 2015 data from Taipei. And uh, we are you we are you are you using uh, two uh, two thousand sixteen data to do uh, cross validation, and uh, uh, and uh, we are working about that. And uh, the the new new model for the this prediction is uh, is more better. It's uh, it's close to to this result. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Our next paper will be presented by Professor Konstantin Kontakosta. He is a professor of urban informatics at NYU and will speak about readmission of homeless families in New York. Hey, thanks very much. Hey, welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to, great to be here. I, I want to um, talk a bit about some of our work today with the Women in Need uh, Homeless Shelters, trying to use data to better understand uh, some of the kind of critical challenges that they're facing in terms of understanding how long are people staying in the homeless shelters? And can we predict this likelihood of once people leave, you know, what's the likelihood of actually coming back? Can we help uh, win, better identify, and better intervene to potentially kind of reduce this, this likelihood or this potential risk? Um, I'm going to say that this is kind of work very much in progress. So I'm going to talk more about just the problem in general and the data we're using, less on the results. Um, also, because I'm really leery of the data scientists parachuting into these very intractable situations and trying to come up with uh, you know, just showing model results and being like, we've solved the problem, right? So this is very much a, a process where understanding the system, understanding the operation and in which you're working, working hand in hand with the people who actually know what's going on on the ground and have to implement this stuff is as important as anything we're going to find from the models. So the models at the end of the day are the last thing we want to deal with. So let's talk about the problem and the actual um, uh, data and some of the how we're approaching it. Um, so about right now, it's kind of hard to tell from this scale and this incredible view, but there's 60,000 people out there who are homeless. 42% of them at any given time are children. Um, and this is a major problem that's become increasingly uh, a challenge, not only in New York, but in cities across the US and across the globe, for that matter. Um, some of the major issues that, that come up for homeless shelter providers and, and Department of Homeless Services uh, is, uh, is two issues uh, that have been identified by Wynn. One is this kind of long-term stayer. So people, homeless families, homeless individuals who are coming into the shelter system and staying for 9, 12, 18 months. And the challenge here, of course, is that this is not the point of the homeless system, the homeless shelter system. The point is to have a stabilized temporary home to then get someone into permanent housing. Uh, so this obviously ties up rooms, beds for others who may need it on a temporary basis. The other challenge, of course, is people who are re-entering the system and, and often repeatedly re-entering the system. Um, and so the goal, of course, for all of these homeless shelter providers and the DHS is to provide permanent housing for folks. That's the end goal of this, permanent, stable housing. Um, so our goal is to try to help use the data that Wynn has, the Department of Homeless Services has, uh, to better understand who is going to come back into the system after they leave the shelter the first time. And when they enter, how long do they actually end up more likely? Will they, will they end up staying? So there's a lot of insight that can be gained out of all this data that's being collected. It's part of the challenge is that most of the data is being organized for reporting rather than analysis. So it's a very big challenge in terms of converting that into a situation where you could derive some of these insights that may at some point be useful. Our partner in this uh, is Wynn, uh, which is the largest homeless shelter provider uh, in New York City. They serve almost 10,000 homeless families a year or at any given time. Uh, really remarkable uh, organization in terms of the social services they provide and other services that they're providing. Um, I should also say this project is funded by a MacArthur Foundation grant uh, that's helping a number of our uh, projects we have going on right now, uh, looking at some of these social equity issues in, in cities. Um, so Wynn provided us with a number of data sets, both from their own, uh, their own sources and from Department of Homeless Services. 
So from 2012 to now, we have demographic data on every homeless individual that came through the shelter system. This includes their medical history, employment history, uh, criminal history, uh, their family history, their household structure. We have data on kind of all the people who exited the system during that time, and we know why they left and where they headed off to and how many returned. Uh, and we also have some other interesting data in terms of the incidents and actual facility data. Because one of the things that we're really curious and really interested in looking at is how much does the physical environment in terms of the shelter matter? How much does the social environment of the shelter matter? So if people who are you know, facing certain challenges are nearby in your, you know, or have a room nearby where you are, does that influence your outcomes? Uh, and then last, how much does the neighborhood in which the shelter matters? And this is kind of really interesting because we're finding that this is a, a pretty significant factor in, in, in uh, how long people stay and also uh, their likelihood of readmission. So part of the challenge was just merging all this data. It started with about uh, 400,000 records. Most of them were duplicates and errors and all kinds of other things. So cleaning all of this, matching it on the different ver various IDs that are used by DHS, by the internal organization, uh, was a big part of just the cleaning process. Uh, the result was essentially we found about 8,000, we identified 8,000 families. And we're focusing on head of household of the family because typically the children go with the head of household. Um, so we're looking at about 7,000, I should say, uh, unique, unique families that we're studying over this period. So we worked through, of course, kind of all of the, the basic data processing steps. You can read more about this in the paper. We've got a lot more coming out on this. Uh, and trying to actually identify some of these performance measures which weren't readily captured in the data. Like length of stay was not actually calculated anywhere in the data set. So we actually had to extract this from, from what we had. So just a little bit of background uh, about uh, the homeless families, at least in Wynn. Uh, so 60% are non-Hispanic black uh, uh, demographic. 43% are relatively younger in their 20s. Um, so about two thirds are single households. Uh, a third have just one or two members in total. Uh, and a third are coming out, um, the, this is kind of, I guess, more the, one of the most interesting ones, why people are, house, are becoming homeless in the first place. Uh, and eviction is the number one, but when you look at kind of domestic violence and discord, and discord is kind of a catch-all for things that are related to domestic violence, that's actually the primary group. So people are coming primarily because they don't have housing, or they can't afford it, or they were kicked out, uh, or they're escaping some sort of very difficult situation uh, in, in, their, in their family uh, arrangement. So we started with a, so a relatively simple set uh, of data from, for variables from, uh, from the data set that we extracted and tried you know, a naive attempt. This is looking at predicting readmission rates. Naive attempt using a logistic regression model didn't do much better than throwing darts. Uh, and so what we ended up with is a kind of non-parametric model using a gradient boosting classifier, which is much better for these types of data in many cases. Uh, and also we had an unbalanced sample. Only about 10% kind of readmit over the course of this study period. So we had to do synthetic minority oversampling to actually account for this. Otherwise, our model was going to always be uh, biased in its result. And our goal was, of course, to uh, reduce the amount of false negatives. The last thing that, that a homeless shelter provider or win would want to do is miss someone who may have been at risk just because the model didn't happen to uh, classify that. Uh, so the, the model results, again, I'm not going to speak too much about this. You can kind of see how they're doing. Um, we're now working on expanding kind of how we're approaching this. So we're using additional features, looking at additional relationships, as I mentioned, uh, kind of those social relationships and the social networks that exist, looking at housing conditions, uh, particularly about the facility conditions and what incidents households or homeless families actually experience while they're in the shelter system. So we know if they experience a traumatic, a traumatic event while they were in the homeless shelter system. We know if they got a job. We know if they uh, you know, had a medical incident. So how much does that impact how long they stay? How much does that impact the likelihood that they will eventually get into permanent housing? And the goal of all this, is, of course, is to help win identify not only those at risk, but also to intervene throughout the process, throughout the time that the homeless family might be in the shelter system to improve their outcomes at the end of the day. So as I mentioned, we're iterating on many of the readmission models uh, and also now working on predicting that length of stay. Um, and a big piece of this has really come into working with WIND to actually improve their data collection. And this, the kind of data management piece of it isn't the sexy part. Any of you who have done these projects know that's 70 to 80% of one of these projects. And so what we want to do as part of our partnership with WIN is to kind of help them think about what they're not collecting, other ways of collecting and coding this information, 
You know, just to give you an example, um, the caseworkers at Wynn uh, meet routinely with uh, homeless residents and homeless uh, families in the shelter system uh, and ask them what's happening in their lives, ask them about employment activities, those kinds of things. These are all qualitative notes that are done. They're done they're in PDF and then they're sent to DHS. So there's incredible information we could extract from this if this was perhaps presented in a different way. Uh, and then this is, as I mentioned, kind of mid, early stage in a longer engagement where we're also looking at other interventions that may be able to better understand how to improve uh, conditions for homeless families in the shelter system, including different ways of sensing, uh, using sensing technologies to understand air quality and noise and some of these other impacts that might have a, a potential effect on uh, homeless shelter, uh, excuse me, homeless population outcomes. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have a whopping 45 seconds for a good question. Yes. There's a mic right behind you. How you doing? Um, I deal with an organization, and we um, deal with uh, foster kids, and they often end, in, uh, end up in shelters. How do you handle them, or how are they represented in your model? Since you talk so much about families, yeah. they don't have a family. Are they not included? Are you classifying them as single? Um, how are they so, represented? So in that case, I mean, Wynn typically serves families with adult heads of households. Uh, so uh, the wind shelters actually don't see too many kids, uh, you know, youth uh, coming in by themselves. Uh, so that's the main thing. And other than that, we're just looking at head of household. So a family could be one person, and it could be a 12-year-old. And we would be capturing that in this case. So we have also data from ACS, I should say, um, uh, Child Services Administration uh, around some of the, the children uh, in these families. But we haven't done too much with it yet. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nat Mamo, who's going to talk about savings for college. He's with Civis Analytics and an applied data scientist. Nat. Thank you. Great. So my name is Nat Mamo. I'm an applied data scientist at Civis Analytics. And I'll talk about the work that I've been doing with the State Church of Illinois promoting saving for college through data science. Great, so to give you some background about organizations, the Office of the Illinois State Treasurer is dedicated to protecting the state's investment portfolio and promoting education opportunities for all. Civis Analytics is a data science company. We were born out of the Obama campaign in 2012, and we work with organizations like the State Treasurer to become more data-driven. So this work revolved around helping them increase participation for their college savings programs, their 529 plans. And it had three distinct goals. First, understand who's currently saving for college understand where they are in the country, and the state, sorry, and what their demographics. Second, identify best targets to engage and do outreach to to expand that base. And third, trying to diversify it so it's more representative of the general population. So this first step involved looking at who is currently saving for college. And you can see here kind of a comparison between the Illinois population, general Illinois population, and the current account holders. We have five dimensions where they're compared on, and a third column for that comparison. This is on age, race, income, gender, and children, household. And so unfortunately, it just reflects society and those imbalances right there. And the biggest differences right now you can see are in income and children and household, which kind of makes sense. If you have a child, you're probably saving for college. But these income ones are pretty big disparities, and especially also for race. So overall trends, you see that account holders tend to be male, younger, more white, and more affluent as well. And it's also interesting to note that while the majority have children, there's still a sizable proportion. Um, you have about 30% that don't have children but are still having these college savings accounts. So it could be a grandparent, it could be an uncle or aunt, something like that. So it's good to uh, keep that in mind while you're targeting new people. So after doing this data exploration, we started to look at, you know, how can we figure out who are the best people to engage after this initial base? And we did that by combining their account holder data with our internal civics data. And our internal service data has a bunch of different sources. It comes from a consumer file. It comes from a bunch of survey data we do, as well as public sources like the census and ACS, which you're probably used to. And with this, we have a very complete profile and description of all their account holders, as well as the rest of the people in Illinois who don't have those accounts, and that we could do this targeting for. This is all person level, and it has over a couple hundred variables, very descriptive. To do this, then, we start to look at, you know, what are these attributes and features we should look for in other potential account holders? So to do that, we started doing lookalike modeling. Lookalike modeling was to help us identify people with a high likelihood of opening a college savings account. You can see here we chose to do a sparse logistic model. We did that because we wanted to maintain some transparency, some interpretability coefficients, because these are going to have real effects on real people. So it was good to see what was popping out of this model. Here we have these three models at the bottom that we used. We decided to use one model for each of the race categories, which is important because we saw huge imbalances on that in that first slide. 
So we did one for each of the five major race categories in Illinois. So we had one for Hispanic, African American, White, Asian, and Native American. And here are three of those models down here. This is a decile ranking. They're all out of sample scores. And you can see what are the percent of signups in each of these deciles. So for the Hispanic targets, you see in that top decile, the highest ranked likelihood to get a new account, you had 74% compared to a random sample of 17%. So it was very efficient. It was, did a good job of rank ordering across all of these. The one that didn't do as great was the Native American one. And that was because you had a much smaller sample size. So there are some things we're trying to work on going forward to try and get at that point. And so similarly for model, model for white targets and African American targets, you had much better rank ordering. We also were to see what are the most predictive variables. And it kind of makes sense the ones that popped out. It's the probability of being a parent, the probability of being a homeowner, as well as the average income of your self, household and census tract. So now we had, you know, who are the best targets to do outreach to? And we started to think about how can we do outreach to them? So we turned to doing digital ads, where we matched these people to their digital presence, their cookies, and we started serving digital ads to them like this. This is an example of what we serve, because what you say today can help keep your child from a lifetime of debt. Try and get them to start thinking about the future, right? We also tried out different message themes, too. Some more benefit, some were more cost-driven. So this first one is talking about the burden of long-term college debt. Try and scare people into, you know, you should start thinking about this now. The second one is kind of a little more optimistic, a little cheery. It says it only takes $25 and 15 minutes. And it's interesting we found that this first one was actually more effective at getting some people to sign up for college. But this was overall treatment effect. So some work we're doing for it actually is going to look at, does that vary across different subgroups that we care about? So after doing, during this and after this digital ad campaign, we can see how this affected account openings. Because we had their like, information, if they were included in the account holder base or not. And we saw that targets were 4.4 times more likelier to open an account than non-targets. We saw that account holders were 23% higher than the previous year. And what's great was to see was that not only did it get more people, it was more cost effective. The Illinois State Treasurer's cost for that year was 50% lower in marketing expenditures. It was huge for them. It's a small organization. It's, it's great for them to save money. We saw that almost 30% of new accounts were opened by someone in the same household as a target. We didn't look only at the individual. We looked at the household, because maybe you know one person saw the ad, but the other person in the house might have actually opened the account. And lastly, we, we did see more representative population going forward, but it's still not where we want to be, like representing the actual Illinois population. So that's actually in our ongoing work right now, and it's actually related to this next step that we have, that we're looking at this message treatment effect across different subgroups. So you know, maybe being more cost focused is good for people who are on a higher income. But if you don't have that much money and you keep saying it's you can bring on debt and costs, all this, it might turn them off. So we're looking at being more optimistic. Maybe it varies from race or gender or income. And that's the work that we're still going on with the state treasurer. I just want to thank the Illinois State Treasurer because they have been a great partner and we're really happy to have them on this engagement. Yeah, no time? No, sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Find me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I work at Think of Us. It's a, a nonprofit tech startup in Richmond, Virginia. We're working with foster youth who are aging out of the system. And fought like, in a lot of systems, you age out at 18, but sometimes you'll age out at 21. But when you age out, you don't have very much of a support network, and that's an issue. So we've created the Think of Us platform, which is a web-based and mobile platform where foster youth can interface with um, a system that allows them to create goals, add supporters, and contact their caseworker on like um, a much easier than normal method. Because what they do currently is they have to make a TILP. And a TILP is a transition to independent living plan. And that means that every six months before you turn 18, you have to kind of be like, this is what I want with my life. And that's very difficult if you don't have a network or if you're changing your location a lot. So some background on the foster care system. There are about, at any one day, there are 40, uh, 428,000 children in the foster care. And about 25 to 30,000 age out without support. It's bad, because 31 to 46% of these youth aging um, out will become homeless by the time they're 26. Um, 40% of former foster youth um, males in Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin reported being incarcerated compared to 10% of the population of young adults. Also bad. <laughs> and 55% of females in foster youth have become pregnant at some point. Um, so one of the things the system uses right now is SACWIS and TACWIS. These are systems that are, SACWIS is for the state and TACWIS is for tribes. So what they do is that's how the, the caseworkers for each foster youth interacts with the foster youth. 
And that software was written in the 80s. If you guys have ever looked at 80s software, <laughs> you might uh, be disappointed with its feature set. So this is the platform. And there are three sides to it. There's a youth side, a supporter side, and a caseworker side. So the youth are able to add supporters, and they go to the supporter side, and the caseworkers go to the caseworker side, and they have slightly different feature sets. Caseworkers can see requests made by the youth, and youth can make requests, make goals, casework and supporters can oversee things that the youth have added them to. So there's also the digital locker, which is a feature that stores data because foster youth tend to lose their uh, important documents including their social security card and um, yeah, so that's bad. Um, this is all building towards a tilt and as we work with different states, we're um, piloting in Nebraska right now and the tilt comes out of the, like, the software and once the tilt is out, they don't have to interact with their, their caseworker to do this every six months because they can update it as much as they want. And um, Using the machine learning aspects, we're able to get hacks and resources to help them complete their goals. Like, uh, if you're trying to run an apartment, we give them guides to run apartments. And this creates an overall plan, which hopefully, upon turning 18, will allow foster youth to avoid some of the more negative consequences. And you can contact me here, or you can check us out at thinkofus.org. <laughs> Okay, we have a whopping two minutes uh, for additional questions. And we had some really interesting presentations. Um, questions? Otherwise, M Meredith, can I ask you, have you, um, to what extent are you expecting to expand this program? Because it sounds like it's already starting to have some impact. Well, um, at the end of October, we officially launch in Nebraska. And then we're also launching in Santa Clara County in um, that's like sort of south of um, San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And then I believe we're, correct me if I'm wrong, Darrell, he's the CTO at the back of the room. We're also launching in New York. Yes? Thank you very much. Let's ask all the speakers to stand up. Um, this is a tough format to do it so quick, so let's give them all a round of applause.